welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy came and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jerry Springer. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jerry. Hey, by the way, as we're uh, recording this tonight, the night before last night uh, was the uh, NCAA championship game. Did you? I know, Gene, you're a huge basketball fan. Megan well, is oh, too. You are too, Megan. Yeah. Well, I'm a UK are. fan, so I'm I'm done this season. Yeah, you were, <laughs> you were done quickly. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. St. Peter's done you. Yeah. 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 We don't need to talk about that, Gene. Okay. No, we don't need to name it, Gene. <laughs> And, they, and all those kids have transferred because they lost their coach, who now is the coach at Seton Hall. This is down in the weeds. But yeah, yep. Jerry, holy God, wasn't that? Did, yeah, I take it, was, it you watched it. Yeah, we game. watched it. Phenomenal what a game. game. It really was. Yeah. Uh, one and, of the great comebacks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of, of uh, basketball, which relates not always to tall guys and women. Actually, I, was gonna say, I want to see where you're going with this, Gene. Where are you well, going? <laughs> well, well, you, you'll see. But uh, and by the way, even when you go to a, I go, I got have t- season tickets to my college's uh, team uh, games, and even the guards who are usually the smaller players, do you ever see them off court? Oh, they're all like nice. six yeah. two, six five, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then the big guys are like you know seven foot. But anyway, I heard this rumor, and I, 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 I Megan, I when I heard it, I said, "Well, that's ridiculous. That can't be. That's that's not accurate." And I argued back. I pushed back. Someone said Jerry Springer paid his grandson. <laughs> I consider a sizable amount of money for growing for growing merely growing he hit well, some height and, and he's probably going to get taller than that a kid's only in like seventh grade or so so from what i understand of jerry's grandson he actually is athletically gifted which the springer yes. family knows it's, nothing about bizarre it's been a mistake no. <laughs> okay so there's a mistake you didn't pay you didn't pay him to grow no for I, merely here's growing here's what i did it was right. clear Just uh, even incentivized as a, as a young <laughs> child that he was <laughs> tall he was always the tallest kid in his yes. grade school grade school class always and he was really growing so i said to him one day just kind of kidding around. I said, I'll tell you what, when you hit six feet, I'll give you $500. And all of a sudden he kind of wells up. And I said, what's wrong? He says, you won't be around when I'm six feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he didn't miss me. Oh, I said, oh, thanks a lot. So <laughs> this is what we worked out. That when they, one day when my days are over and they lay me out, <laughs> Yes. I will have five crisp $100 bills in my front right pocket. Yes. And, and Mickey will put them there. And so when people walk by the coffin and kind of say their goodbyes and hug the, per, you know, the, the body and then move on, uh, Richard has been working on how he would come up to me, hug me, and while he's hugging me, his hand would slip into my right front well- pocket to get his 500 tell, bucks. I got to tell you, Richard's got some competition now because now we know where it is. Yeah, now that's right. at that funeral. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. He screwed the whole thing up because he is now six feet tall. Oh, did you pay him? So, well, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 that, so that's what happened. What, as he was growing so fast, I realized we, this is, so we made a, we cha- altered it a little bit it would be whoever hit 510 first because i'm i was sh- i'm shrinking <laughs> my age and he wasn't yet 510 so he was getting up to 510 i was <laughs> getting smaller and each time we were together we would measure and uh he, Jerry, I'm going to start he, betting he, you money. That's all I know. Like yeah, listening yeah, to this. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, anyway, 
Yeah, but he's a capitalist and he's figured out. He's a capitalist. He's now now figured out. Go for the money. I have grandkids. Matt and I are getting into old, old people's grandkid stories. But I've yeah. been, uh, <laughs> and my grand and one of my, my oldest grandkid is uh, my son's daughter, Josie. She's, I don't know. She's the dancer. 15. Yeah, yeah she is. <clears throat> a lovely dancer. So yep. when I was a kid, <clears throat> my brothers and I we, you know, had two brothers. We lived in kind of a dorm room our whole lives, all the way through college. So we were always together. In, in one room, it was a blast. It, it, it's the only, if you have, you know, all boys or all girls, I, to me, it's the only way to grow up. You get really close. And anyway, we had this thing where, and I'm sure a lot of families, a lot of kids play this, where it's annoying as hell, but it's called got you last. And just walk in oh, and yeah. whack the other brother and say, got you last. And it becomes a competition that can last all night. And you'll- So you've been walk. charming your whole life, is no. what you're saying. <laughs> So I started doing that years ago <laughs> when she was a little kid and I just walk, Hey Josie, how you doing? Got you last. And she's like obsessed with it. So yeah. now, now she's 15. She, she's going to be driving. I walked yeah. her home the other still- day and she walked up and, and, you know, hit me. It's not a hard hit, but it's a tap. And when I leave, she will chase me down. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so I said to Josie, about a year ago, I said, when I die, and I'm, we're, Bonnie yeah, you and I can't agree. come by and say, gotcha, lady. Oh, she is. <laughs> I, and we're not doing yes, those. She is. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to, we're, we're, we're good, donating our bodies to the University of Cincinnati, blah, 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 blah. And they cremate them and they send you the ashes or whatever. That's what my mom is doing too. That's cool. Yeah. So she, I told her, in whatever container I'm in, you go by there and you get me last. That's how this game has to end. She yeah. disagreed. All right. <laughs> she disagreed. Jean, no, we're going to talk about your family issues on another episode because we just don't have that much time this evening. Got it. But thank you for sharing. <laughs> Too, many. Too many. Hey, Jerry. Yes. So we know you've talked about it here and uh, it's gotten some pub. It's a, actually, it's kind of a big deal, but after being in television for how many years? Uh, 31 years. That's a long time. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, in television, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. If you count the news stuff. The and, news, uh, 10 years. Amazing. Yeah, 40 years. That's yeah. almost so my an, age. It's an impressive yeah. career. All kidding aside, congratulations. Yep. It's impressive. And you uh, have retired from that, most likely. Who the hell knows? Something could come up. We know that. But look, you know, probably you're retired. You, yeah. you have said you're feeling healthy and you want to enjoy some other stuff. But I was wondering, and, and I think Megan's really good at this too, of giving uh, life advice. <laughs> uh, but I've always told you it's my f- experience and i'm not not the expert on this a stimulation is required to be happy you gotta have some stimulation doing something yeah what are you gonna do every day yeah what the hell are you gonna do every day and Uh, and yeah what what are you what what do you do oh well i've got the um the videos of my five thousand shows so i will just (laughs) i will go to my room now, Jerry, now, sends me I, any food on a tray. I shut the door <laughs> and I sit there and watch 5,000 episodes of me. So here's the honest truth, Jerry. Like we've Four. seen you in many iterations, right? Like we've seen yeah. you on Judge Jerry. We've seen you on Springer. We've seen you on the news. We've seen you on Dancing with the Stars. I yeah. think it's time for you to put out life coaching advice. Ooh, I think you I like make that. a video every week of like your Springer thoughts, be kind to yourself and one another. Yeah. And also here's how you dance the cha-cha. I think that's how you start. <laughs> that's how I, I think would, that's and, how that would be my final thought. <laughs> there we go. And here's how you dance the, you know, Foxtrot, nice. you learn this stuff. Like we yeah. can learn from you now, Jer. Oh, what about, uh, oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> 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 what about Pilates? Could you teach Ooh. Pilates? Do you think? Well, I mean, where is all this shower bends? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think bends in the shower. 
I do that. That is good because it also it also improves your balance. Because yeah. you don't want to fall in the shower. That's you know, well, I, Mickey, I think that's help! I can't get up. <laughs> it up. It happened again. I need you back in here. <laughs> I've oh. fallen out of bed. Oh, and now I've oh yeah. Out. And that was a disorder. I had a disorder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we covered that. We should. Yeah. Hey. hey or how to take it? Metamucil. You're very good at that too. I'm contacting the company. I, I should be doing an ad for them. <laughs> hey, uh, you have seriously thought about, I, well, and I've heard you say this, I've encouraged the hell out of it that you teach a class at a university. A yeah, I would like would to be... do that. Yeah, I, I, something, I mean, I may do something, uh, I don't know, with serious radio, or I might do something with- uh, You should do those TED either, Talks, Chair. Or the, you know, or teach a class at, at a college on- Like the new college or, or do TED Talks yeah. or something. Like you really do have, I mean, in all honesty, a lot, to offer people like as far as your experience goes like i would shoot i've been paid to listen to you and i i would pay <laughs> you to listen to you <laughs> hey and i Let's think talk after the show <laughs> <laughs> i think right. that uh sirius xm would be a great idea on of whatever yeah. format whether it's i mean just to sit in for people once in a while stuff like well, that you know even, i'm not looking for a full-time job but Hey, I'm going to throw an idea to you that's a serious idea. I hadn't really thought about it until we started to talk about this, but Sirius XM, and I listen uh, pretty regularly to various music uh, genres. And one of them is actually the music of my youth, which would be uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. That kind of covers the range. It's of, no longer on 50s and 60s. Sure it is. You believe yeah, yeah. that? No, no I look today. No, it's on. I heard it yesterday. Uh, it's called 50s Gold and 60s Gold. It's there. It's there. I got Lawrence Welk. That's the last thing no, I heard. No. no. Anyway. <laughs> hey, Can Jerry. you two hear yourselves? Can you hear it? I got I Lawrence so well. Welk. I get no, my no, glass no, of prune juice. I sit down. <laughs> I turn on Lawrence going, Welk. Going. And I'm doing fine. But what you could do is uh, something uh, with folk, actually, I think, as far as being on in their music genre of, yeah. of, yeah. Uh, of kind of DJing some music, because that's something you know a lot about and you really love. Anyway, yeah, well, you know, and woodworking, I don't know if you do woodworking. Or, <laughs> can you or, can you whittle? Do you know how to whittle? Repair. Yeah, go out in your shop. But... <laughs> Anyway. No, not whistle, whittle. Whittle, oh, whittle. Yeah. No, hey, whittle. I got things and I, <laughs> I apologize okay. for this because we got off on a tangent. And yeah, we got made, it back to the show. And it's made us go uh, out of order what we usually do. So now we're going to go back yeah. and, and do this second thing out of order. But Jerry's, well, we say the heart of the podcast is Jerry's... Uh, take on something that he's seen in that this week in the news and there's stuff has been pretty heavy these days we know that the backdrop for so much is the uh war in the ukraine and uh anyway and we i don't know always what jerry's going to do but i'm just going to say what caught your interest this week Talk well uh actually uh the supreme court uh hearings yeah. on uh you know, whenever there's a confirmation hearing on a nominee for the Supreme Court, inevitably the issue of judicial philosophy comes up. What does he or she see as the role of a justice when the issue before the bench is the constitutionality of a particular law or act? Is it to rule based on what the justice believes was the original intent of our constitution's authors back in 1787, a view mostly held by conservatives, or is the Constitution to be viewed as a living document, evolving as society does over time, staying faithful to the principles of democracy, principles later articulated by Abraham Lincoln as a government of, by, and for the people, certainly adhering to that framework, while at the same time taking into account today's highly complex world. Conservatives resist this approach. They would have us believe that that is simply allowing judges to overstep their constitutional authority. 
that is to say, to actually make law. I disagree. They're not making law. They're simply making timeless principles adaptable to the world we live in, which seems infinitely preferable to justices constraining themselves to words written over 235 years ago that may have no relevance to our current existence, a world that scientifically, politically, and culturally didn't even exist back then. But if treating the Constitution as a living document can admittedly at times be difficult, the alternative, the conservative side, that says justices should simply apply the Constitution based on what was originally intended by our founders, well, that approach is more than difficult. It's impossible. It's a standard without substance. You see, it's not just the intent of one person that needs to be deciphered here. There were 55 delegates at the Constitutional Convention and reading the transcripts and notes of their deliberation, it's clear they didn't all have the same intent on every article and section of the, of the document. They each had to compromise their positions in order to get at least nine of the 13 colonies to go along with the final product, nine needed for ratification. The point being here, there is no singular intent represented in the original constitution, nor even in the amendments passed along the way. For example, with the passage of the 14th Amendment in the 1860s, with its equal protection clause, did the authors really intend equal protection when it be generations before African Americans and women got anything close to it? It's a total fiction to believe original intent is a fixed standard by which constitutionality can be determined. It is merely a fanciful rationale for a justice to resort to so as to reach a conclusion that he or she wanted to reach in the first place. Recognize it for what it is. It's a cover for bias. Be not fooled. If the text doesn't comport to what the justice wants, the concept of original intent is simply discarded. For example, conservatives are quick to point to the Second Amendment for what they see as their absolute right to own and possess guns for whatever reason they choose. But the Second Amendment is actually one of the only places in the Constitution where the original rationale, intent if you will, is actually articulated. It states, and I'm quoting here, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. Now, if the founders intended that people should have the right to bear arms for whatever reason, be it protecting one's family, hunting for food, sport, or whatever, why would they decide to just mention a well-regulated militia? It makes no sense. Indeed, the only way to conclude that gun possession for whatever reason is a constitutionally protected right is to ignore the doctrine of original intent and see the constitution for what it actually is, a living document constantly growing with and adapting to the times. In this case, seeing that people would want guns for personal protection in a society of rising crime. To see this as a right worthy of constitutional protection is to be willing to dispense with this fiction of original intent. Let's stop playing games. The Constitution throughout our history has always been a living document. And like all living entities, if it doesn't adapt, its future is extinction. Our justice system ignores that reality at its own peril. Wow, Jerry, that's really excellent. It makes me think. In you don't WD, change, you die. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Covington, Kentucky, uh, I, I live in Ludlow, Megan's a little farther south past Covington, but we're, we're both Kentuckians. Mm -hmm. And in Covington, Kentucky, I think it was last night, you may have seen this in the news too, Megan. Mm -hmm. so there was a, uh, some conflict among kids. We're talking mm -hmm. kids. 17 year olds. 
and there are four kids. One of them is very young, and that mm -hmm. real young one is in critical condition, and they had guns, they got guns, and they shot things up. And it, uh, on your point, Jerry, that is not a well-regulated militia, the defense of the proliferation of guns around America, Sacramento, California, Ohio yeah. now just passed and got a bill and was signed by the governor where there's no regulation of guns. You can just put a gun under your, you know, stick it in your pants and cover it with your shirt and walk around. No licensing, no concealed carry permits. It's freaking crazy what we're doing. It is. It is. And we should we should figure out what is a, you know, we're not going to get rid of guns and there are people that want guns for legitimate reasons. So let's figure out a way that we can have a society where guns are, you know, used for your protection at your house, at your home. If there's a uh, hunting going on, that's a, that's a, a separate thing as well. But to, to simply take the position that the constitution says I can have a gun for whatever reason I want and nobody can regulate it. Nobody can do anything about it. That's nonsense. Yeah. It's crazy. All we keep doing is burying people. Yep. Yep. Well, what's happened is uh, <clears throat> conservatives have extended your point to say, not only should I, do I need a gun to protect my home, but I need a gun to protect I deserve. me on the streets. Yes. And then once you take that step, <clears throat> guns can be in everybody's. Listen, when I was in HR and different warehouses and stuff, people were allowed to bring guns into our workplace. Like they were, if they had a concealed and carry, they were allowed to come into our workplace. How, like, that's a very scary thing. And I have no problem with gun ownership, responsible gun ownership. But when you are able to start just bringing them in and out of a workplace, I was an HR rep. Do you know how people would get mad at me? Like, what if, yeah. You know, it's that kind of stuff that you have to start thinking about. And it's really, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit out of control. Well, has, in my opinion, has anyone ever been to a bar? <clears throat> right. You bar? Right. You're in a bar on a Friday night. And yep. do you ever go to a bar on a Friday night? <clears throat> and sometimes during the evening, a fight will break out. Uh, you yep. know, guys will get whatever. And they take it out on the street. Imagine if it's okay now to just have guns. I'm not yeah. saying everyone who gets in a fight will use a gun, but some will. But some will. And they'll shoot someone, and it's not always the guy they're fighting. Yep. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, yep. some, some mm -hmm. night we should, and plenty of people do this, take on the question, because you laid it out, Jerry, properly. I have two guns, so I'm, I'm not anti-gun. Uh, I'm not either. I have ammunition in my home, mm. and it's not to protect my house. It has to do with <clears throat> my country travel, grizzly bears, and this and that. So, but I have guns, and I know how to shoot them, and I've shot them plenty. But I'm not because it's. And by the way, in <clears throat> Kentucky, uh, and I just referenced Ohio, just changed to what Kentucky has had. I can take my Ruger 454 Kazool, <laughs> which is a pistol. And carry it anywhere I want anywhere. in Kentucky. And I can take a 12 gauge shotgun anywhere I want in Kentucky. Now you can do it in Ohio. So what we have to tackle is, I think we all agree, what we've all just said it, none of us of, of we three is anti-gun. Nope. But how do you, and now that concealed carry is gone, Megan, you made a comment as a PR, as a uh, HR professional that well if you had a concealed carry permit which meant that you had some training some knowledge of gun safety you yep. could come into your workplace with a gun now anybody can come into workplaces with a gun i guess unless the company specifies otherwise so how do you draw lines especially when someone is saying to you I am afraid to go on the street without a gun. And you know, it's all the dog chasing the tail, 
once yeah. more people are shooting at each other, then more people feel like they've got to carry a gun for protection. But, but Gene, isn't it the bad guys that take care of the good guys that take care of the guns with the bad guys? Like, come on. Like, yeah. isn't that the rhetoric? Like, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Yeah. Like, that's the rhetoric that we hear. Yeah. yeah. I have you no know? idea how how we ever get this under control. Yeah, uh, I don't either. And Jerry, don't we kind of attack it around the edges? We say, okay, well, assault rifles or extended magazines or you know some of these various devices silencers a, and all that yeah, kind yeah, of nonsense yeah banning you know grenade launchers banning that <laughs> stuff yeah. but how do you stop well, somebody you can't, from having you can't totally wipe out gun violence of course i mean you know you, you're always going to have uh have to have laws which and people to enforce the laws, whether it's police or, you know, police officers, et cetera. So, but we, if we could get society to agree, let's start having some sensible legislation that is enforceable, we'll cut down the amount of people killed with guns. Yeah. You know, we can lessen the number. It's just like, we're not going to wipe out disease, but if you have enough doctors and enough medicine and enough whatever- you say something limit. like a vaccine, you can limit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, wh and we're going to hear from Cody Lee Meese here shortly. Megan's going to hey, be Cody. In, in, in 10 seconds. But Jerry, again, your commentary clearly points out that the rationale that are that is being used for the proliferation of guns is illogical. Yep. The, the if you're going to be a strict constructionists of the constitution the it's, only it's, thing it says about guns is a rel, well regulated yeah. militia if you go back yeah. and study history we all know what that means yeah and it does it just means we're not saying therefore that the constitution says no one can have guns the con all we're saying is that the constitution doesn't guarantee you the right to have a gun for whatever reason you want you got that it right any right any right can be uh uh, regulated for a legitimate governmental purpose well, and public every... safety. Yeah, it goes with every right. There is a, you know, you have the right to vote, but we can regulate and say you can't vote until you're 18. You have the right of free speech, but you can't yell fire in a theater. I mean, all these constitutional rights, every one, there is some regulation to it. If it's a legitimate- There's a responsibility to it. Yeah. If you and, have a uh, right, then you have the responsibility to- like carry that right. You and know? therefore I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of these United States. <laughs> of I Sar think we can do better. Of Sarasota, Florida. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jerry. I would here love we go again. Run. Hey, Gene, we'll right? travel around this state. We'll, <laughs> it's just you and I, we go to New Hampshire. <laughs> Let's see what works. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, we have Cody Lee Meese with us this evening. Hey, Cody, how are you? Hey, Cody. Doing good. How are you doing? Hey. Doing great. Now, okay, where are you coming to us from, my friend? I am coming to you from the dining room of my home in Somerset, Kentucky. Nice. The dining room of your home. Jerry's in a basement That's somewhere. Right. It looks like Mickey <laughs> locked him down there. <laughs> that should be a song. Jerry's yeah. in a basement. Yeah. yeah. Story of my life. <laughs> Well, I was so, born. I was born in a base. Well, actually, I, yeah, <laughs> that's another story. But I was born in a bomb shelter. It was that's right underground. I was born underground. Go ahead. We, we, we. <laughs> Cody. <laughs> All right, Cody. So yeah, you should not ask the questions that you want to ask because he'll tell you the story. Um, <laughs> so what brings you so you know casey what brings you to us today are you working on a new album what's going on in your life man yeah uh actually i've got a few singles getting ready to come out on friday um excellent which uh which will be big bad love how does your medicine taste and fall on the fire which we actually recorded out in oklahoma and uh we're working with a an outfit out of fort worth texas called smith music group and they're helping to kind of push and promote they're just really doing a lot of good things for us and that's really what it takes and all this stuff you know like uh, you meet young artists and they're like hey man you got any advice and it's like yeah just remember this one thing you can't do anything on your own period no, you cannot you know yep. so you got to be good in your heart and as long as you're following you know 
you're, you're living right and treating people good. The universe will guide you to the people that believe in you and support you and can help you and have the tools that you don't have. And that's really well, what unless so unless you're that. Gene Galvin, who's just kind of been a jerk to everyone his whole life, and he still gets <laughs> I, I can tease, sympathize to a I, I, I used to be a pretty big jerk myself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's, there were well, times. there's no room for jerks here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no, I'm reformed. I'm a reformed jerk. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Can you teach Gene then? Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm Gene, still I kid because I love. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, All cool. right. So your first song, uh, your song this evening for us is How Does Your Medicine Taste? Tell us a mm -hmm. little bit about this song, where it came from, and how it came to be. Uh, I kind of, so my, my writing style is extremely lazy. I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of guys that are, are friends and songwriters, and, uh, and they're every day, you know, they have a goal of like, all right, I'm going to write three songs today, no matter what. Like, that's my exercise, I'm going to write three songs. Whereas me, I mean, I might go, a month, two months without writing a song because I don't worry about just content, content, content. For me, it's like, you know, if, if there's a, a seed subconsciously in my mind of something I need to work through or get out, then it'll find its way. And if yeah. I try to force that or rush that, then it's, I'm going to just screw it up entirely. It's going to be junk. Uh, yep. So how does, your, how does your medicine taste was largely musically influenced by a band who I'm really, really into called Turnpike Troubadours. And, uh, and I guess before I knew it in writing the song and the story behind it, it was, it had been about a, a breakup that I had went through um, during some really big struggles with addiction that I was going through. And uh, I guess it just ended up being me working through that. And it just kind of found itself as a song. And uh, so I was going to throw the song away because <laughs> uh, I didn't think anybody would like it here at home. And, uh, I was actually out at the Honky Tonk Hotel in Missouri at my buddy Jim Guthrie's house. And, uh, and I was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm probably going to throw this song away. But I, I, want, I want you to hear it and just tell me what you think. And I played it for him. And he told me, he's like, man, I want you to know that I love you. But if you throw that song away, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right, dude. <laughs> I'm like, you got it. I mean, that, that story so, had Honky Tonk and Guthrie in it. So we know it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool, though. So, like, he, he was yeah. one that inspired you to keep it on and keep it going, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And my wife gets mad at me all the time because I just throw stuff away. I'll write a song and, and I'm just super self critical. And if I don't run it by somebody else and I'll leave it up to my own judgment, it'll wind up right in the trash can. So. Well, so, I'm not allowed to throw stuff away anymore. Nope, not allowed. And we are going to follow <laughs> yeah. up with you on that. All right. So we have Cody Lee Meese with How Does Your Medicine Taste? Awesome. I think we. Oh, oh go he's ahead. back. All right. That was Cody Lee Meese with How Does Your Medicine Taste? And I'm here still with Jerry and Jean, and we apologize for both of them. But <laughs> Cody Lee. <laughs> Where can we find more of your music, sir? Uh, you can find it right now on uh, Spotify, Apple Music. Uh, I think it's on Amazon, YouTube, all kinds of places. Cool. And what's your web address? Uh, it is CodyLeeMeeseMusic.com, I think. Awesome. My manager so usually handles all this stuff. I'm tech illiterate and I live under a <laughs> rock. So I'm not Perfectly. Okay. So Cody Lee Meese, check him out on all of your platforms for social media. And while you're there, please make sure you're checking out the Jerry Springer podcast, Tales, Tunes, and Tom Foolery. Make sure you give us a five-star review so that those that own the internet know that we're there. So uh, Jerry and Casey are going to take you out on Down by the Riverside. Mm. All right. Hey, David. Yeah. Uh, before we start the next one, uh, is it just my headset or is Cody's audio kind of cutting in and out a little bit? And if so, do you have any recommendations that he might do at his end? I think he's using a mic and a headset, right? Looks like you got earbuds. I think he's just using his cell phone microphone. Okay. Uh, indeed and, all right and this song is love ain't worth the trouble yes okay perfect here we go let's go right. to the second episode 
Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy came and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jerry Springer. Thank you. Going to be back another week. Yeah. Another week. A lot of stuff going on. And but Jerry, uh, uh, yes, Gene. We uh, always say that the heart of the podcast is the commentaries that you do. It's because uh, we goof around a little bit here. We call it Tales, Tunes, and Tom Foolery. And we do have uh, for the tunes part, by the way, Cody Lee Meese. We had him on. Welcome back, week. Cody. It was great uh -huh. to come back. He agreed. He's from Somerset, Kentucky. Megan will be chatting with Cody in a few minutes. Um, and we've got some other things we're going to talk about as well. But uh, Jerry uh, takes a look at the events of the week. It's a weekly podcast, obviously, and comes up with a, a take on something. What caught your interest this week, Jerry? Well, uh, actually, just last week, if you followed the headlines, it was clear that America was being treated vividly to an exceptional teaching moment, a pure example of what a Supreme Court justice in the ideal should be and an equally clear example of what he or she must never be. The ideal, of course, was Katanji Brown Jackson's performance uh, at her own confirmation hearing. And on the other end of the spectrum, the blatantly unethical behavior of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in violating the most basic standards Americans have the right to expect from the highest court in the land. First, the positive model, Judge Brown Jackson an obviously historic nominee, first African-American woman so offered by a president, sitting there in the witness seat, perhaps the smartest person in the room, certainly more accomplished than the senators who embarrassed themselves by playing plantation owners, condescendingly asking her to define what is a woman, are you religious, and do you contone child pornography? And in an inspiring display of character, she never lost to cool. She never snapped like Justice Kavanaugh did at his confirmation hearing a few years back. She just did what most African-American women have done throughout their history. Through gritted teeth and firm resolve, she politely smiled and then answered calmly and rationally so that any objective observer would understand that she, like any African-American of achievement, got to this exalted position by working harder and being stronger. Only a complete partisan would find her not qualified to be a justice on our Supreme Court, which is why she is confirmed. What parent would ever not want their daughter to be like Katanji Brown Jackson? Well, and then of course, there's the other side of the character coin an example of how a Supreme Court justice should not comport himself. There's Clarence Thomas. And by the way, this has nothing to do with his judicial philosophy or the leanings of his recorded opinions. It's about honesty, integrity, and respect for the institution he represents. As has been well reported, his wife, Ginny Thomas, Thomas a major player in America's right-wing movement, and an active participant in Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the presidential election of 2020, she is now under investigation for her role in last year's insurrection of January the 6th. It all came to light when the National Archives and Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, released to the committee investigating the assault, the texts of 29 emails she exchanged with Meadows on the planning, occurrence, and aftermath of the attempted coup. She was actually advising Trump's and Meadows on what they should do. Now, of course, Trump and his acolytes were doing everything they could to block the release of these records, even defying subpoenas. Subpoenas issued for the express purpose of deciphering what happened, who knew what and when, and who was ultimately responsible for what turned out to be one of the darkest days in our nation's history. 
Perhaps unsurprisingly, the effort to enforce these subpoenas worked its way up through the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court, where of course, Justice Thomas sits. On the one hand, being a loving husband, he certainly doesn't want his wife to be in trouble. So as a personal matter, he wouldn't want these emails and conversations to be released, thereby exposing her to potential criminal liability. But of course, he's not just a devoted husband. He's a Supreme Court justice and therefore must be aware of, if not his moral ethical obligations, certainly his federal legal ones. Specifically, that a justice must recuse himself from any proceeding in which, and I'm quoting here, his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. In fact, the law provides an example of when recusal is called for. And that is, again quoting, if a spouse has any interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the case. Well, obviously, when the case regarding whether emails and records should be released to the investigating committee, emails that could well determine his wife's criminal culpability, when this question is before the Supreme Court, how in the world does the outcome of this matter not affect her? Of course it does. And yet he did not recuse himself. In fact, he was the only vote in this eight to one decision, the only vote not to release the records that implicate his wife. There is no counter argument to this. You don't have to go to law school. You don't even have to have watched Law and Order or in my generation, Perry Mason, to know that you can't be a judge or a jury member in a case involving a family member. In fact, the only possible defense Justice Thomas could mount as to why he didn't recuse himself is that he didn't know at the time that she was actually involved. How is that defense at all believable? Not only are they in a long-term marriage, they live together. They call each other their best friend. How could he plausibly not have any idea of her political activity and involvement when certainly everyone else in Washington did? On the day of the insurrection, when the whole world was watching live as it was happening, did they not discuss it at the dinner table that night or over breakfast the next morning? Can he not see that the mere appearance of unethical, illegal behavior damages the credibility and confidence people have in our justice system, which is already tanking at its lowest point in generations? I know Justice Thomas won't resign, but if he doesn't recuse himself from any further cases involving the insurrection of January 6th, he should. Good one, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Sure. Those are our two good related teaching moments. Speaking of a teaching moment, and this is happening across the country. Have you guys noticed that the Republican Party and the conservative movement in general has been targeting school boards yep. to elect yeah. people, their, their own kind, to school boards? And they're using all these fake issues of critical race theory. There is no such oh, thing unless so you're oh, yeah. at Harvard yep. in law yep. school or something. Uh, and they're book burning. Jerry, you covered that on a, a commentary. Don't say gay in Florida. Yeah. Like yeah. All, all of this stuff. nonsense. Yep. So uh, let me tell you what happened at a, a place called Turpin High School. And it's just a high school in a suburban area. It happens to be of Cincinnati. But there are places Eastside, like this all yeah. over the country. Yep. And um, they, I would say it's a conservative school district uh, generally, uh, yeah. but their last school board was kind of mixed. There was an African-American woman on the board, a very liberal uh, professor from Xavier University, and it's a five-member board. <clears throat> and now they're, they have basically taken over the school board, they being conservatives. And they had for seven years, a thing called a diversity program. Now this is important to note, it was voluntary. And the yep. only way you could attend it is if your parents signed a permission slip saying that you could then be on this day, pulled out of class and go off to a series of workshops and lectures. 
So just for the people whose parents and who's in the kids say, I'd like to do this. The very last minute, the day before the diversity day program, <clears throat> they canceled it. The school board told the superintendent to tell the principal at Turpin High School, cancel the event. Well, the word they used was postpone it. And they used as their rationale that uh, this permission slip wasn't specific enough to oh, spell perfect. out the exact sessions that these kids would be going to. A problem, by the way, that for the last seven years wasn't a problem. So right. uh, it was only that this new school board got in and now they're looking for whatever red flag thing they can make into an issue. And uh, the kids, at least some of the kids, kids who were going to attend it got really pissed off. And I used to teach a class on school politics at the grad level in the education school at my old university. And I will always would tell these teachers who wanted to be principals when we would talk about who's got political power. I said, the kids have huge political power. They just don't know it. Yeah. And whenever they figure it out, they realize, oh, my God, we got power. So they like called the media and the media came to the homes of kids and did long TV interviews. Jerry, you've been in the news business. Yep. You can picture this happening, right? Oh, it's a great issue. Yeah. Then yep. the crew out to do a, what you call a package yep. interviews and, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they did that. The kids say, don't believe this postponement thing. They'll use now the excuse that we got graduation coming up and we got testing and no time to do it. So uh, it's another example of how the country's gone a little nuts, but this is the appeal I wanna make. And Jerry, you tell me if you're hearing stuff like this going on in Florida, but here's the appeal. Democrats, I'm a Democrat. We're all three Democrats. Yep. We need to get our folks to run for the school board because the game is on. Yeah. Yep. This is like political warfare. Sure. Who would have thought it would go down to the local school because board? Because it always comes level. down to that, though, doesn't it? Like it always no. come down comes down to the local level. It's the yeah. very like first thing that you see every day that influences your life every day. That's where politics work. Like we look at it like with the Congress and Senate, like that's so much larger than our everyday thing. School board is yeah. what affects us. Yeah. And like, particularly when you talk about the culture wars. Yep. Yeah, that's that's School where board, the right city council they can make it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's where it's happening. You remember, Jerry, from your years of running for several offices uh, in, in Ohio, whether it was Congress, city council, mayor. Uh, took a look at a Senate race governor, that the uh, school board races were largely seen as nonpartisan. Yeah. And, you know, there may have been some really? people who wanted to use oh, yeah. the school board races. Uh, they were nonpartisan, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty huh. much nonpartisan. And they still are. I mean, you don't, you don't have uh, right. on a school board a ballot, Republican list and a Democrat listed, but you do have the Republican Party Pushing candidates, putting them. I was going to say, but you have the ballot. issues. You have the issues that are Republican yeah. or Democrat yeah. issues that are being sure. In, yep. Well, here's yeah. one, one one last thing on this Turpin thing. I know this district uh, really well because I used to live in it. My kids actually, uh, both my kids are graduates of Turpin High School. Here, here's the deal. This is where this is so so sad. It is not not totally, uh, but a largely. Uh, I don't know, lack of a better term, white bubble school. Not, yep. not totally, but it has, you know, mm -hmm. a limited uh, diversity within its population. So God bless these kids and staff and parents who wanted to try to bring some attention in a school that has that kind of climate, mm -hmm. some consciousness of other viewpoints and other uh, cultural backgrounds. And my God, if there's any place, trust me, the schools where I work my entire career, Cincinnati Public Schools, we didn't need any diversity programs. Just look around the hallways. Right. It's full of kids from all different backgrounds, lifestyles, et cetera. Yeah. So when they try to bring in a program to open people's eyes to some stuff, the damn school board kills it. Yeah. It's I mean, it's just yeah. uh, pretty stunning, I think. Well, Gene, 
now let's let's talk about some privilege here because um you visited me this past week that's correct that your uh pro we'll call your primary place of work yes and it, i'm a but, working man and you know that, right? <laughs> jerry did you hear about this i heard i heard yes. about their transportation so I literally, so let's talk about some privilege here, Mr. Galvin. Yeah. Because I get a phone call on a Thursday afternoon at my place of work that says, hey, Megan, this is Jean. Like, yeah. I know who you are. You come up on my phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to need a place. Is there a place that uh, we can land a helicopter within walking distance of your restaurant? And I literally said, I hope you're joking. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm not joking. I'll just call the city officials and see if we can't land this helicopter. So as we're talking about privilege, Mr. Galvin, why don't you go ahead and talk yeah. about this story yeah. a bit? <laughs> you, I want to hear about it. that. You went on a helicopter. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, just to have dinner someplace. Hey, close and, in all. Aurora, Indiana. Right. And not just anywhere. The place is called, <laughs> let's brag about this place for a second. Third in Maine. In Aurora. Third in Maine. Hi, Rudy. <laughs> yeah. Aurora, and Indiana. It, and it is phenomenal. Did and you love we it? We talked about it. I sure did. We talked about it a month or two ago on an episode. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals star quarterback, uh, just this, you know, rising star of a kid. Joe Burrow she went there with his girlfriend. Megan told us that. We discussed it. Yep. So Megan enlightened us to this place where she is the events director and wine mistress and all this stuff. And said, <laughs> <laughs> and said this is a great restaurant with roots in a steak place in Cincinnati called uh, Ruby's, Jeff Ruby's place. And yep. it's well known for this. And by the way, Megan, tell us th this restaurant, Third in Maine, is a steakhouse. It has other things on its menu, lots of stuff, but the yep. steaks are amazing. And what is the, is it Wagyu, W A G? What tell us what that is? It's Wagyu. All that means is Japanese beef. It yeah. just means Japanese yeah. cow. That's it. But really? it's where they come from. So when we have the A5, those are certified from different, uh, they call them, and I'm, now they're going to yell at me because I'm not going to remember uh, preclatures that have different like places in Japan that these cows All are right. from. Like these suckers live on like the steep hills of Japan in the snow. We have Hidagyu, we have all kinds of different um, types, but they all have different flavors. And these cows, I'm telling you, they're treated better than Jerry is, which is difficult. <laughs> well, <Like> well. <laughs> We'll have to, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. Have to talk about it. It is an amazing restaurant. The food is great. What and did Lewis, you end up having? You, you had like the Australian, didn't you? I think I you got, it was, yeah. It was amazing. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to use his last name because it's, you know, people will be looking him up. His name is Lewis and I met him through Jerry many years ago. So blame Jerry for this. <laughs> he was great. You know, I just called him. I just well, call him the man, the man in the velvet jacket. <laughs> I got that same, I got a different story. But okay. what's making me upset about this is not that you went by helicopter to a meal. Yes. A few years ago, I went with him to lunch and he took me to Bob Evans by <laughs> helicopter. That's great. Not a That's great true. steakhouse. This is God's truth. He, he took you to Bob Evans. <laughs> right. And he didn't call anybody. He lands the damn thing in the parking lot. <laughs> and he and I step off the helicopter. And, and I think this is crazy. What are you doing with it? Okay. Yeah. So we walk in and we're sitting there at the table ordering our, you know, fried eggs, uh, over easy, <laughs> whatever, nothing. <laughs> and the manager comes over and says, uh, excuse me, Mr. Springer, it's not my helicopter. I didn't fly it. I had nothing to do with it. We need you I to was, move your I helicopter, was hijacked. Sir. I was kidnapped. 
And now, by the way, I, if I had a you driver. Have to work, so, of course, as we're sheepishly walking out of the restaurant, you can see everyone shaking their heads. Oh, that's Springer. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jeez, I had hell. someone come and pick up my friends, Jerry. I had a lovely yeah. woman named Brooke go pick up Gene and his wife and Lewis. Mm-hmm. And, and it was delightful. She was great. Um, why don't you have people working for you like that, Jerry? Like, that's. I, you would think. You would think. You would by think. the way, we had. <laughs> Hey, all I did was I executive produced the trip. It needed somebody to executive produce it. So I called, I called Aurora, Indiana City Hall. And I said, hey, the is there city. A, and I told him, I said, we want to go to Third and Main. Is there a place where we can land a helicopter coming from out of town? It, it turns out that the damn uh, helicopter ride was like 10 minutes, 12 minutes was embarrassing. And they said, ah, I don't know. Uh, let me call the chief. And then the chief called me and said, hey, you can land on the heli- helipad, you know, at the, the emergency thing up on the hill. where." The God forbid was. anyone have an emergency um, that emergency night. Emergency can't be there because <laughs> Gene's having his Japanese stay. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, here's how it worked. Helicopter lands. We're waiting for Brooke. Thank you. And thank you. Brooke, that she was wonderful. Came He's up such a cutie. It was a few <laughs> minutes away, but it was too far to walk. They can't. It was wonderful. Oh, oh, you had a walk. And and well, oh, no, I they didn't. I and sent a trade. I trade, sent a driver. <laughs> we are oh. saying very specifically the truth, which is third and main in Aurora, Indiana, is I swear a place to go it put it on your list it's really really good very cool very cool ambiance great backstory it's got a lot of history to this while structure. we're talking about the truth did they give you a break on the check no 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 no, no i charged no. him extra no no <laughs> no and out of it came well what's the difference lewis would have paid for it anyway why am i asking lewis, that lewis did pay lewis did pay <laughs> <laughs> Lewis did pay. But now in trade, <laughs> hang on, in yeah. trade, I called Lewis the other day and I said, I got the second one set up because he, and he's, you know, gone places to eat and he's always trying to figure out how do we land. People should know this. Uh, and yeah, For those of you with helicopters. Yeah, didn't he say obnoxious. there's a place in Alabama? Is that where you're going next? No, no, no. But but it's pretty obnoxious to land a helicopter. It's very turbulent. <laughs> it's just noisy. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. But it's real fun to fly on them, I have to admit. So I said, yeah, I know this. <laughs> I know this place in Augusta, Kentucky called the Beehive. Got is so that where you guys story. went afterwards? Well, we're heading there, but it's, it is a place that has a similar story. It's an old historic building. It's been uh, revitalized. It's got great food. And, uh, and so I had to call Augusta, Kentucky and I saying they did the same drill, man. About four <laughs> hours later, the chief Jeez. calls me and he says, yeah, I can get you. And I, and he tells me, you know, where, where to go. No, I don't fly the helicopter, but I can see it from the air. He told me what to look for, blah, blah, blah. So now we're headed on another day. we got the date set. Jerry, come on up and you can roll down yep. there with us. We love it because we got to get you involved in this so we can blame somebody for this. <laughs> anyway. So I literally get this phone call, like, where do I land a helicopter? And I said, I need then- you to just go right to hell, Gene Gal. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is this phone call? <laughs> I tell the restaurant and they're like, yeah. what, how, why do you know these people? Yeah, who are these <laughs> Well, I, the way it played out is I said to Lewis, um, hey, there's this, no, he said to me, what, what's that restaurant you were talking about one time in Third and Main? And he said, what about there? You think we could take the helicopter down there? And that's how it came about. I don't know. Oh my God. Anyway. So, so for those was- that are, <laughs> I'm glad you guys came down though. It was such a delight. Bonnie is always so delightful to see. <laughs> yes. She is. She's so cute. <laughs> but it was, it was uh, excellent. And uh, anyway, we're, we're going to do, uh, we'll do another one sometime. We'll get Springer uh, in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Cody Lee Meese, you're back with us this evening, sir. Welcome Cody. back. Hey, yes, ma'am. Thanks for having me. Somerset, Kentucky. What's going on down there tonight? Not a whole lot. Just rain. Just it's rain. Much, it's a small town. <laughs> Not a whole lot really happens. Pretty much. I know rain. Somerset. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
So you were with us last week. We invited you back because we loved what we heard. And so tell us a little bit about Love Ain't Worth the Trouble, the song that you're going to share with us tonight. Uh, that song kind of got, I wrote it on accident, sort of. Uh, That's kind of the story of your last yeah. song. <laughs> it's, yeah. You have a <laughs> lot of accidents. <laughs> I'm, I'm accidentally successful a lot of times. My wife chalks it up to good luck, but I don't know. Yeah, no, that's. I think <laughs> that's I've, awesome. I've been to jail too many times to have good luck. <laughs> well, that's okay. Gene, Gene understands. He, he's yeah. there. <laughs> that's where you know Gene from. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, man. Pulaski County Detention Center. Sure enough. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so now, what album is this song off of? So. Uh, technically not even an album yet so i had uh, okay a, i put out a five song album uh in 2020 in april little did okay. i know you know what that year was going to be like Ta-da! Uh, but put out a, yeah right <laughs> phenomenal and it was funny because i remember the uh, the new year's party like as we're waiting on the clock to hit 2020 and my wife and i were with a bunch of our friends and we're like man 2020 like this, this is going to be, gonna be it <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> and My husband and I later, did the same wah, thing. Wah, wah. Yeah, yep. everybody was so pumped. And then it was like, well, I guess we were wrong. <laughs> I'm just fattening on the couch now. So here we go, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> 2020 did not do much good for my physique. Don't feel bad. <laughs> totally yeah. get it. Man, I was, totally I was like, so it. excited to. I even thought about maybe I would lose weight in 2020. Yeah, that nope. didn't happen for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, and I love to cook too, so that didn't help none. Well, we we ate a lot of bread that year. That's all I remember is all uh, the bread. <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of chicken tikka masala for me. A lot of stir fried yep. rice. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That sounds good. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> right. All right. Yeah, I love Cody. <laughs> All right, Cody Lee Meese. We have love ain't worth the trouble. Listen to this real quick, and we'll get right back with you. All right, that was Cody Lee Meese with Love Ain't Worth the Trouble. And Cody, tell us where we can listen to more of your music and check out more of your background. So uh, for background checks, you'll have to go, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, you can use my that. social yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, just really on the, just YouTube, Spotify, just look up Cody Lee Meese. Uh, We've got a few singles getting ready to drop. Uh, I'm going Thursday to start recording a 10-song full-length solo acoustic album called No Excuses. Very and then cool. uh, later this year, yeah, and then later this year, we'll be doing a 10-song full band album. So. Very, very you. cool. Good, good. Well, we look back, we look forward to having you back again, Cody. It's always a pleasure, and we love lists, like finding local artists. I'm glad Casey brought you to us. While you're choking, what choking? Oh my gosh, checking <laughs> Cody out. Holy cow! Man. Ouch. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> While you're checking out Cody, yeah, <laughs> man, I hope that wasn't a premonition. <laughs> I would be scared to drink or eat all night. Right? Yeah. Please, please look up us as well we'll just go with those words <laughs> look us up on jerryspringer.com jerry springer podcast and tales tunes and tomfoolery give us a like give us five likes if you could we would appreciate it and in the meantime go to our archives check out some of our previous artists and listen to uh prior episodes we're gonna have jerry and casey taking you out with down by the riverside and please no choking okay you all come back <laughs> Thank you, Cody, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Uh, thank you, Gene. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. guys. I appreciate it. All right. Take it easy now. See you. Have a good one, guys. Later.